Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Friday, April the 6th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the day, and everybody's got to be feeling good because the weekend is here. It's it it's arrived. Woo-hoo. It's a good thing. <laughs> And around here in Connecticut, we actually had some snow today, so the the gardening crew got the day off. But uh, we are now pushing for uh, influencing warmer temperatures for this coming week, so that because because there's a ton of work lined up, and we got to get it done. <laughs> so well, that's exciting that you've yeah. got a ton of work lined oh, up. Oh, there, there there are like I, I'm not sure how many customers are currently lined up who've already been seen, but I think there are like 20 consults lined up. Not to mention the work that's already lined up to be done. So. Yeah, we're we're off to a blazing start, no doubt about that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very good stuff. How about you? How are you doing today on this beautiful Friday? I'm doing really terrific. Um, I have vacation coming next week, and I'm doing my favorite kind of vacation, which is called a staycation. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. So I, pl- I plan to spend much time in thought and in deliberate focus and juicing up the manifestations that I'm desiring. So that to me is all exceptionally fun. Very good. Very, very good. Well, we've got a good weekend coming up for that. And I I mean, I, I was noticing I have like a pile of stuff that is like growing bigger that needs to be done. I, I put most of my time, actually today I put all my time in on putting the book together. And I'm pleased to report I've got 45% of it put together, which is Considering I started yesterday, that's pretty good. <laughs> wow, you really move fast. Yeah, I'm moving right along. Well, it helps when you use styles and so forth because then you just plug in, okay, headline, byline, paragraphs, you know, that kind of thing. That helps a lot. But, um, yeah, it's it's coming along nicely. And uh, just because, I'll, I mean, I'll get it together just because it'll be put to good won't mean that it's done, but it'll certainly be very far advanced toward being done. So it's it's exciting. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. We like progress. We love progress. Uh, I'm looking forward to the weekend, although I have to admit there's also things I have to do on the weekend. And this time, I mean, other weekends I like to say, yeah, I'm going to do something, and then I take the weekend off. This weekend I can't do that. I have some stuff I have to do this weekend, so it's going to be a busy weekend. But that's Well, you know what? That will be a perfect opportunity for you to really practice your segment intending. That's exactly what I've been doing today. And yeah, you're right. I'll be doing that over the weekend as well. And I am very pleased to report, since I announced that I was going to start doing that, I've been doing it. I've been doing it really consistently. In fact, I don't think I've missed yet today. I'll have to think back on that. But I don't think there's any activities that I had to do or that I was planning to do that I missed doing a segment. Oh, yes. Well, I didn't really miss it. I didn't deliberately segment anything when I went to have lunch, but that's a fairly easy one. (laughs) Well, I mean, you're really taking this concept of, you know, setting a segment intention uh, per every different thing you do really seriously. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, I never even took it that seriously when I did it a long time ago. Now it's autopilot, but it's like. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Well, I am taking it seriously. I, I think if I'm going to do this, I really want to do it. And as I've been doing, like the, working on the book, the book is, is a wonderful task to be working on, but it does have some stuff to it that can be a little bit you know, wearing as you're doing it. So I'll be taking a break uh, periodically, and I'll even use the break as my opportunity to do my next segment intending for when I get back to the book. So I'm even breaking up the segments into segments. Wow. And just to remind people, if they didn't hear the the show yesterday, segment intending is a way to set a positive intention for the next set of things that you plan to do. Like you kind of break up the day into like little individual events, like lunch is an event and going to work is an event and going into a meeting can be an event and, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's what Walt's talking about. Oh, yes. And the reason I'm doing it is because I know I have a history of just not really monitoring myself real well when I really get dug into doing a whole bunch of tasks. And so I can have a tendency to slip into a, you know, a negative kind of a a place, even get into a spiral sometimes. So this is my way of saying, you know what, I am determined I'm going to stay positive and I'm going to do it by realigning myself periodically, periodically throughout the day, which is what segment intending is all about. And it's working. It's working. That's the good part. Cool. Yeah. Well, I had I had something kind of fun today. It may not sound fun at, at 
initially, but it really is. Okay. So I woke up somewhere around 5.30 this morning, which is unusually early for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's usually like bathroom break, come back to bed. Right, right. And instead <laughs> it was bathroom break, come back to bed, brain not going back to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one too. <laughs> So I went, all right, well, what can I purposely choose to focus on now that will feel good? So I picked a few things and um, it was, I noticed that as I was focusing on deliberately the things I want to create, um, different tasks that I needed to do at my job today kept like intermingling. (laughs) Okay. And finally it was about, oh, maybe quarter till seven. I went, well, I am not falling back asleep. And I'm thinking so much now about my job, I think I'll just get up and go to work. And that's the pleasure of working from home. I just get up and go to work. There it is. And um, because today's my last day before I go on vacation for a week from the job, um, you know, there's just all these extra little somethings, make sure this is covered, make sure this person knows about this, et cetera. And so I just jumped in when nobody else was emailing me. So it was kind of like I stole an hour this morning to really get a lot of progress. (laughs) which felt awesome. And now I'm at the point that normally after our show, I go back and work for an hour or two. Now it's like I pretty much finished everything. And so I'll only need to handle whatever things come into my inbox. And it's like, oh, what a great feeling that is. That is. Um, And I was really just following my impulse, which is I went, well, I'm not sleeping. And see, in the past, I used to like lay there for another hour, just kind of, a little frustrated that I couldn't use that sleep, that time to really sleep. Cause usually by the time eight o'clock came when I needed to get up, then I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I heard Abraham one time saying, well, if your body's awake and it doesn't want to sleep, then it doesn't want to sleep. Yeah. So you might as well get up and do something. And well, I went, yeah. Huh. And I've been practicing that whenever um, I can't go back to sleep. Sometimes I'll go meditate Sometimes I'll turn on the TV. Sometimes I'll just go sit in it. I'll just move different locations, go sit in a recliner and just think wonderful thoughts. But it's very, very different than when I used to end up feeling frustrated because I couldn't sleep because this is all about following the energy, following the good feeling. And the good feeling was get up and go to work. Mm -hmm. And then that was followed by one thing on my to-do list taken care of, then the next one, then the next one, the next one. And it was like, while I was waiting on a download that normally takes five minutes, I was playing a game. How many things can I get done while (laughs) before that thing finishes downloading? And then I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to throw in a load of laundry while I'm at it. It was like, I was just having fun playing with time. And if I didn't have that extra hour, I probably wouldn't have felt like I was in that position where I could play. I would have felt more like, okay, I just got to get through this stuff. (laughs) Well, I love the fact that you said that you stole an hour. Because people, <laughs> so how many people complain there are not enough hours in, a, in the day? So you, you found a solution. You stole one. I thought that was I great. I stole an hour. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. And then my win for the day, I mean, this feels really nice. I, I've got to ponder on this a little bit more. Um, but the other day I was talking about somebody that I work with that I, I, I just feel, you know, I kind of rub a little bit wrong with. I, I, they're very, they feel very brusque mm. to me and we don't really communicate well because I'll ask these very specific questions and I'll get a very vague response, which causes me to have to go back and ask three more questions. And then I get maybe one of them answered and I'm like, oh my God, it takes forever to like get <laughs> what I need from this person. And so I also thought this person was just kind of like, I don't know, would, not that he brushes me off. But it, I guess it's just, it really is more in the, we just don't communicate the same. Well, you feel like a so, dentist because you're trying to pull teeth all the time. Yeah. And I feel like he, like his world is more important than mine. And even though, you know, he's above me on, on the food chain, um, I have a belief that nobody's better than anybody. We all just have different roles. I can't do what he does and he can't do what I do. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make him better just because I report to him. So anyway, today, um, oh, there was, you know, some more just normal stuff. And he happened to shoot an email to me and my it was kind of like, hey, when you do blah, 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 please make sure I'm included in this kind of thing going forward. And my first reaction was like, (laughs) all right, not that he caught me doing something outside of the scope, but it's like, 
you never told me you wanted to be included in this. You just came on board with our team. How the heck would I know? You know, and I felt like I was being treated like, well, you should have known. And, you know, here's what I want from you. And it just felt very critical. And so, meanwhile, a couple hours goes by. And now I'm having an, um, an instant message conversation with another coworker. And we have to talk about this guy. And she's like, I asked him for his time. Will he be here? And what do you what do you make from his email response? I said, well, what it says to me is nothing. It didn't really tell you anything. So she like is emailing him while we're IMing and we're just laughing at the response. I said, well, he still didn't answer your question. And now there's more vagueness than before. And um, she's like, you know, what I think it means is he's stalling for time. And I went, huh, hadn't thought about that. I thought he was just being vague intentionally. That's a good idea. Yeah. But, but, you know, because she is a different person than me and saw it in a slightly different way, all of a sudden I started asking myself a new question like, well, how is it I missed that? Or what else might I be missing that could be very present? And s some new idea popped in my head, which is the thing that happened this morning when I felt like he was being critical of me might have been purely informational. like how I would have worded it is, hey, by the way, now that we're working together, just want you to know in circumstances like this, here's how I'd like this to happen, which I would have received very easily. Well, he's not me. And he, he said it the way he says it. But it could have meant what I just said. Sure. It could have just been an FYI. But instead, I realized I took it very critically, like he was being cruel in his delivery. And I went, oh, my gosh, this is a leftover from my dad. So here's a little remnant with a, 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 a male authority figure who didn't communicate with kindness the way I like it to be communicated. And I went, huh, well, maybe because then I send out an email to the whole team telling everybody that I'm going to be on vacation next week and letting them know what to do in my absence. And he sends the cutest response. That was like, you know, hang back, have fun, get relaxed. And he sent a Bitmoji. Do you know what a Bitmoji is? Okay. So a Bitmoji is where it, it's a pic, it's kind of a caricature of self, but it has animated stuff around it. And his Bitmoji was this martini glass with him hanging in the martini glass with a little umbrella. And part of his message to me about having fun in, at, on my vacation time is, you know, sit back somewhere and have, have a green umbrella kind of drink or whatever. And I went, see, that's so friendly. Okay. And yeah. that's so kind. And I'm like, well, see, now there's the warm fuzzy that I really like. Mm -hmm. So he, it's, it's not like I went, oh, well, see, he is capable of a warm fuzzy. <laughs> I, I know that's who he is. He's a big teddy bear. He's a big teddy bear. And, but because he's a big teddy bear, just like a real black bear, they have a really big growl that you can kind of get afraid of. And if a black grizzly bear is playing with you, beware of those giant claws and paws. Oh, yeah. They can hurt you even if they, they are intending to play. And so it just kind of, I was thinking about him like that. And I went, you know, I'll bet I've been making up the meaning that he's cruel. Because that's a leftover thing from my dad. And he, he probably isn't that at all. Or if he is, I certainly don't have every reason to continually um, dis, uh, decide in advance when I don't know for certain that it has an ugly meaning. And that's so for me, it was just a really nice, nice way to go, oh, this is me choosing meanings. And I said the other day that we are meaning makers. We are, actually, I said that to someone else, not here, but anyway, so I'll say it now. <laughs> we are meaning makers. We get to determine everything in, in terms of what it means to us. Very rarely is there an absolute. And so we determine what something means. And I put a very negative slant on the meaning of how he communicates to me. And I'm now going to look at that through a different lens. Like, no, he just communicates more like a grizzly bear, a big black grizzly bear. But it doesn't mean he has ill intentions. It just means that he commutes in bear, communicates in bear language, <laughs> and I communicate like in puppy dog language. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> well, that that's a good insight, though. That's a very good insight that you had. So congratulations on achieving it. Well, thank you. So that feels nice, though. Yeah. I'll have time. I'll, I'll take some time and just kind of. I'll, now, here's another something I don't think I've ever talked about. I'll condition that response by playing it over and over in my mind and expecting the new result. Okay. And imagining the new result and even replaying what happened today and imagining my new perception instead of the one I had. And that's how I condition the positive new result. So what you're doing is really not the opposite. It's sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, it's 90 degree right angle <laughs> of the topic that we're addressing first with uh, the book today because we're, we're still looking at the law of attraction, the basics of the teachings of Abraham. We're in part three, and the subsection is entitled Attention to What Is Only Creates More What Is. Well, you're, you're not actually paying attention to what is. You're paying attention to it as what you want it to be. You're changing it in mid-thought. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Is there a secret to that? Practice. Practice. <laughs> <laughs> Practice. Well, and it's, it's kind of funny because there are certain things that you are grabbing a hold of and practicing and doing, and they're different practicings than I've done. Mm-hmm. You know, and I do believe that, like, even Abraham's book, um, Ask and It Is Given, they have 22 different processes in the back of the book. That's true. Um, for how you can adjust your emotional uh, feelings, how to, how to get a feeling of relief. But they clearly make, they clearly state in the book, as well as I've heard them say this, you know, on CDs and other recordings, that not every process is intended for every person at any time. And I like to take that a little further and say, because we're all such individual people and we all have our own preferences, that do whatever it takes to do whatever you need to get done. Meaning, it's going to probably be like how you get the results that you need to get will probably look very different than how I go about it. Simply because we're different people, we have different filters, and we have different preferences. Oh, I agree. In fact, uh, I I recommend to people, uh, especially if I'm chatting with somebody on Facebook, there are a lot of different uh, modalities, a lot of different practices you can do. Try them and find which ones work for you. Because just because exactly. mine works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you and vice versa. <laughs> so here's, here's, this is so funny. So Keisha, who's staying with me right now, mm-hmm. um, I had gone downstairs to go get something for myself. And I was staring at this stack of bananas on my kitchen counter. And I just kept thinking, Keisha. Bananas, Keisha. And every time I walked by the kitchen counter, I just kept feeling like I should bring a banana up to Keisha. I didn't know why. So I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. So when I came back up the stairs, I went into her room and I said, hey, I brought you a banana. I know they're not usually, she likes bananas that are like uh, more well done. (laughs) I like them when they're a little bit more on the right side, not yet right side. Uh Uh-huh, okay. And so I said, do you still have a little teeny bit of green? I don't know if it's quite at your readiness, but I just kept thinking banana for you. <laughs> she laughed. She went, okay. So she takes the banana and Walt, I have never seen another living soul do this. You know how like there's the stem part at the top and you yep. pull the stem back, you know, to like unfurl the banana. Right. She turned it upside down or what I would call upside down to the part where it's a, like a black nub mm-hmm. on the end. Yep. And she started peeling it from that end. Yeah. And I, I looked at her. What? I, I've actually seen that. I've seen a video about that. I've never seen anyone do that. And so she peeled her banana upside down. And I just laughed. And I said, Keisha, truly, is there anything we do the same? I truly think <laughs> everything we ever do is so completely opposite. And we're such dear friends, you know, we learn so much from one another. But again, if I were to tell her how to eat a banana, she would probably balk. Now, I'm kind of playing with this as a silly metaphor, because she has her own way of eating a banana. Mm -hmm. So who am I to tell her or anybody else how you, quote, should eat a banana? Because we all have the way that feels right to us. Because even watching her 
eat the banana that way was almost making me squirm. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> the way to do it. You know, I mean, not really. It was not that big of a deal. But it just seems so weird to me that she did it upside down. But to her, what I do is probably upside down. Mm -hmm. It's really all a matter of perception. But that's what I love about our uniqueness. And, you know, even when I work with clients, you know, I'll say, here's what I do. Now, does that even feel good to you? And if they're like, well, and if I could tell they're squirming, I'm like, all right, let's come up with a different exercise. Let's come up with something else. Or I'll just like hone into who they are and I'll, an exercise will come to me, something I've never done, but it just came to me like intuitive wisdom. And they'll go, oh, I can do that. That sounds fun. I'm like, whew, okay, that was intuitive guidance. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what you're talking about there reminds me also, there's another food that everybody has, or most everybody has one particular way of eating it. But there is a way, again, shown in a video that shows what the person putting out the video says is a better way. And I'll tell you why in a second. You, you know, if you have corn on the cob and you're peeling that way the husk in order to get at the corn and so forth, most people mm -hmm. will peel from the top. And that, that actually makes sense to most people, right? And then, of course, you're pulling all the little strings off, right? Because the, the, the strings right. feed it to all the different uh, um, niblets, as they're called by uh, one of the corn manufacturers. I can't think which one it is. But <laughs> anyway... Um, this particular video, the guy was showing us how to do it from the other end, from the stock end. And his reasoning was, if you do it from that end, you don't have to deal with all the strings. And, and you saw him do it. Literally, everything just peeled off of the corn. The strings went with it, and he had this bare piece of corn. I'm thinking, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Well, you better be, I'll guarantee you that's how manufacturers do it. Probably, <laughs> most I've likely. Wondered, how do they get no little corn strings in well, there? Well, apparently that's how you do it. You do it from the other end because that's where all the strings are going to. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, I love variety. <laughs> I totally yeah. love the, the, the variety, except for when it drives me crazy. <laughs> but your, like, your like point is great, I was though. talking about earlier, or he, he, he communicated differently. That drove me crazy yeah. until yeah. I found a new way to look at it. So it's all good. <laughs> and, and you're right about the fact that everybody has different ways of doing things. And, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. If different people have different ways of doing things, then we're going to have also different ways of getting results. And you never know when a new way of doing something is going to get an even better result. So I say well, it's a great know, I, thing. I was reading this article the other day. It was in LinkedIn. And it had to do with working from home. And the article writer, the author, he was coming from the perspective of, look how much money an individual saves when they work from home. And he was, you know, saying, you know, because now there's no commuting costs, you don't have to go out to lunch, you know, you may not have a huge dry cleaning bill. And Anyway, he just went on and he was listing all these things. So his perspective totally lines up with me, because for me, the moment I started working from home, I got a raise, is how I look at it. Because I didn't have to commute and I wasn't spending 10 plus dollars every day for lunch, etc. So anyway, I read the comments and I normally don't do this, but it was funny because I read the comments and there was so much contradictory uh, viewpoint that I was reading. You know, one person's like, oh, no, you know, I don't like work. I don't like the idea of working from home because. There are too many personal things in your house that can get you distracted. It's better to be in an office where the intention of being in an office is that's where you do your work. And of course, I'm thinking I started working um, at home because I have less distractions. I had more distractions than an office, you know, than another person, you know, was just talking. Well, anyway, I won't go into all the details, but every person had a different viewpoint. And I read about 10 different comments and I just chuckled. And I took in that information from the perspective of we really are all different. And I would have written the article almost identical to how the author wrote it. And I would have felt really content and satisfied that I had written a really valid piece of work, you know, with this opinion. Mm -hmm. And then when I read everybody else's opinions, I went, huh, it didn't take anything away from what the author said. It just caused me to realize there's so many more than one point of view. Exactly right. You know, so anyway, 
<sighs> I wonder how that's all going to fit into what we're going to read today. It always fits in. You know it does every single time. It never, <laughs> it never ever fails. So let's find out. Okay, so the subsection right. is entitled, Attention to what is only creates more what is. And it says, the law of attraction is responding to you, to your point of attraction. And your point of attraction is caused by your thoughts. The way you feel is caused by the thoughts that you are thinking. So the way you feel about yourself is your strong and powerful magnetic point of attraction. When you feel poor, you cannot attract prosperity. When you feel fat, you cannot attract thin. When you feel lonely, you cannot attract companionship. It defies the law. Many around you want to point out reality to you. They say, face the facts. Look at what is. And we say to you, if you are able to see only what is, then by the law of attraction, you will create only more of what is. I love that point. Because here we live in a world where... We know now, particularly from quantum physicists, that there is nothing truly solid. It's all matter that has been organized through energy and that it can change. It can change position. It can be in two places at once. <laughs> I mean, it, there's a lot of craziness that goes on there. So the question becomes, well, why does it stay so similar? And the answer is because we expect it to. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. It's almost a silly answer, but it really does explain a lot. It explains very well, clearly. And, yeah, I mean, if you think that what you see is all that there is, and that's your point of view, and you keep looking at that same point of view, you'll keep getting more of that same point of view. That's right. And as it says here, you, you can't get anything different. That's right. That's true. Not until you change the thought. And as it says here, you must be able to put your thoughts beyond what is in order to attract something different or something more. Your emotional attention to what is will root you like a tree to this spot. But an emotional, in parentheses, happy, vision of what you would like to begin attracting into your experience will bring you those changes. And then in italics, much of what you are now living, you want to continue. So... Keep giving your attention to those things, and you will continue to hold those things in your experience. But anything that you do not want, you must take your attention from. And actually, you have to do more than take your attention from, don't you? You have to put your attention on something else, because we're really not capable of attending to nothing. That's true. So you really have to put it on something else. And, you know, um, so probably about 10 minutes before I had to get ready to call you for the show, mm -hmm. um, I started going, ooh, I wonder, I started to imagine what foods were down in the pantry. Like, I just want to nibble on something. I want to <laughs> nibble on something. And I looked at the clock, and I went, well, I just had lunch like an hour and a half, two hours ago. Mm. And it, so I started asking some questions. And my first question is, are you really hungry for food? And, I, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is because it has to do with where do you place your attention. Right. And in, initially, what I thought I wanted was food. Now, if I kept – what I've done in the past is if I'm wanting food, I just keep thinking about food. And I keep thinking about what's in my pantry, what's in the refrigerator, what can I put together quickly. And I'm so single-mindedly focused on food that eventually I'll pick something and gobble it down. But today I asked a different question, and I think this kind of comes to the, the very last part where you said, um, but anything that you do not want, you must take, from, you, take your attention from, mm -hmm. meaning if you don't want it, you got to move your attention to somewhere else. Right. And so I thought I wanted to eat, but as I asked myself a question, do you really want to eat? No, yeah. And then I asked a different question. Is your body hungry? No. Hmm. Mm. Well, those are kind of two contradictory thoughts. They are. And then I asked a new question. All right. So if my body is not hungry, but I want to eat, what is it that maybe the, the desire for eating is actually masking? What is that I really want? Good question. And the answer was, it wasn't what I, well, it was kind of what I want. But the answer to me that came was, I'm fidgety. Because I'm really excited about going on vacation. Hmm. And I only have 10 minutes until it's time to call Walt. And I didn't have anything pressing I had to do. And so it was kind of like, well, since there's nothing pressing to do, but I have 10 minutes to kill, 
eating was kind of my natural autopilot. Ah. But it was a very fun exercise for me to just ask a series of questions. Because when I landed on, well, I'm really just excited about, I'm almost ready to be on vacation. I went, well, that had nothing to do with food. And in that moment, it was like the thought of eating went away. Like I'm like right now, while I'm talking about it, I'm aware that I literally distracted myself so much from the idea of food that I never even went back and said, well, should I then decide not to eat? It's like, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about my vacation. And then I looked at my um, computer and a couple emails came in. I processed them and boom, then it was time to call you. So you didn't even have to come up with an alternative of what you wanted to do. It just sort of came to you that, oh, I got to do this, do this. And oh, look what time it is. Yeah, because it wasn't even what do I really want to do. It really ended up being what this thing that triggered the I want to eat. What is that really about? And what it was really about was I'm excited about being on vacation. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. And, yeah. and I'm like, just like a kid who knows that they're going to go to Disneyland. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm excited. Yeah. And so I didn't take my mind off of food deliberately or purposefully. Just through the series of questions, I just followed where the questions took me. And it took me away from thoughts about food. So I did get my mind off food. And I think I did exactly what the sentence says. Anything uh, but anything you do not want, you must take your attention from. Right. You moved your attention. Yeah. Interestingly so enough, too. Because cool, uh, honestly, I didn't want to eat. I knew I was wanting to eat, but I didn't want to eat because I'm like, I just ate and I was mm. really still kind of full. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how I'm saying want and it's meaning two different things. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm desiring to eat food, mm-hmm. but my body mm-hmm. wasn't really in sync with wanting or needing to mm-hmm. eat food. <laughs> no, <but you laughs> so weren't, I wanted it, but I didn't really want it. You weren't really hungry. It was more like a default no. thing to do. It was totally an autopilot default thing. Yep. Yeah. And you did, and, and, then, and you distracted yourself very nicely from it to the point where you were doing the emails and for that moment you actually had forgotten the idea of going to get some food. Yeah, I forgot I had nothing to do because all of a sudden I had something to do. <laughs> that too also, yeah. But so, you know, as I've been talking about Project Body, that little thing that happened for me was not little. That was actually a big component in the manifestation of Project Body. Oh, sure. Because I'm shifting and changing the autopilot behavioral responses I've had in the past as to why I was overeating. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Because I know, I know I've eaten for all sorts of reasons that had nothing to do with hunger, mm. you know. But, you know, it's like when I went to Weight Watchers a million years ago, um, telling me I had to eat these certain foods on this program did not take away the desire to eat the foods that were not on the program. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing in that program changed my thinking. I just temporarily changed my behavior and I did it defiantly because I was nine years old and my mother sent me to Weight Watchers. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't my idea anyway. (laughs) Which makes it even worse, really. Yeah, but I didn't learn new food behaviors. And it was funny because after 10 weeks, of mom paying $5 a week. Now, mind you, this was back in the late 60s, so $5 per thing was a lot of money. Yep. Um, after 10 weeks, she finally decided to pull me out of Weight Watchers because I'd only lost two and a quarter pounds. Oh, my. Oh, jeez. <laughs> what she didn't know is I was eating Snickers bars during the day when she couldn't see me because, honestly, I didn't – I was nine. I didn't really understand this concept of dieting. I didn't know why – I felt like I was being punished, mm. being having, you know, having to eat these weird foods, you know, and doing things that felt so unnatural for me. Um, what I've come to understand now as a grown adult is how my body knew what I really wanted and what I was being told to eat on Weight Watchers wasn't it. Like, for an example, and now remember yesterday I was talking about food rules and I've heard all these food rules and now it's like no more rules. Right. So the Weight Watcher rules at that time, because I was, you know, not an adult, I was supposed to eat four pieces of bread a day. Now, most kids love bread. I didn't. I mean, I might eat an occasional dinner roll, but I didn't really even like sandwiches. 
And if I did eat sandwiches, I wanted it toasted. And I, I, I just, oh, the thought of like white Wonder Bread was just hideous to me. Well, at least and you have good all... taste because I mean, let's be perfectly honest, that bread is hideous. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> I put it this way. My sisters, when they were younger, they're younger than me and like, later in life they would take their wonder bread and roll it around into a ball oh yeah and right. they would make what i would call a gluten ball yep you know and i'm like oh my god and who, and then they'd eat it and i was like oh, ah! <laughs> so here i am at nine don't really care much for bread but now i have to eat four slices of bread a day oh jeez. because i'm a kid i have to have two eight ounce glasses of milk a day guess what i don't like milk i've never liked milk <laughs> Then you have to eat fish five times a week. Guess who hated fish? Me. So I was like disgustingly take, taking in this food that was gross to me. Oh, my God. I just had this light bulb moment. I must share. <laughs> okay. I totally get now why the desire for how I want to live when it comes to my relationship with food is that I wanted to enjoy the food. I wanted to enjoy flavor. Oh, yeah, sure. Because while I was on Weight Watchers, I was denied flavor and was by my authorities, which is my mother and Weight Watchers. They were telling what it, me what I had to do. Oh, yeah. And I was doing what I loathed. Yep. I hated bread. I hated milk. I hated fish. And none of it tasted good to me. Oh my God, it was so hit. This is so hysterical. So now let's talk law of attraction. Mm -hmm. I'm hating these foods. I'm in so much defiance and rebellion. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to eat food that tastes horrible to me. That every time I was being disgusted by what I was told I had to do, and I was doing it because I felt I had to, every one of those experiences was an intense, Rocket of desire being shot off energetically, vibrationally into the stratosphere where my inner being grabbed hold of and went, got it. I'm holding it for you. What we know you just said you wanted, even if you didn't use words, I want to enjoy the flavor of food and I want it to be good. It's funny, too, as you were saying that, I was thinking about uh, one of the little rampages that Abraham does periodically. Uh, they beat a drum. Typically, it's about money. So mm -hmm. they'll say something like, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money. I don't. And that's what I was hearing you saying. I don't like the food. 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 <laughs> it sounds like the same thing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so what I was really saying from the preference part of me is, I want to enjoy food. I want to enjoy food. I want to enjoy food. I used to. And now I can't anymore. Oh my gosh, no wonder the idea of f enjoying the flavors are so important to me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And like when I go to um, um, some big holiday functions, um, I have a friend that sometimes I go and I join their family. And my friend had had a gastric bypass. And so I'll watch her. She and I will stand next to each other as we go through the buffet line and put food on our plate. And she'll just put a little bit of everything. But then, because, you know, her, her stomach is now really, really teeny. Right. And then when it's, you know, we're all sitting around a table and we're eating and everybody pretty much is, you know, eating up their first plate. And then they all, we all go back for seconds. Well, my dear friend, she, first of all, doesn't have any reason to go back for seconds. And then when it's time to clear the table, at, l at least half of the food is still on her plate. Wow. Because she can't allow herself to eat it or it'll literally make her get very violently ill. Oof. So she knows she can only eat a little bit of everything. And I remember years ago when a different friend of mine had suggested that I get a gastric bypass because she was getting one. Like, you know, it's a twinsy thing. Let's I, remember all together. You, I remember you told that story. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember my, the first reaction I had to her suggesting it was, I don't want to only eat a little bit of food. And I don't want to spend the rest of my life getting ma the majority of my nutrients out of supplements that I'll have to take. Mm. I don't like to swallow pills. Mm -hmm. That whole concept, it was like so, now I can see it more clearly, like now, right now, while I'm talking about this, I can see it more clearly that that equated to the same kind of experience I had when I was in Weight Watchers, sure. where I was being forced to do something that was unnatural for me. 
unnatural. So now that I'm li starting to live in the manifestation of Project Body, where I am free from food rules and where my body is finally free to get to a natural weight so I can be the person I know I really am, um, it's like now when I eat, oh, my God, food tastes so good. <laughs> Like last night, I said, you know what? I'm kind of in the mood to make some tuna salad. And Keisha said, okay. And so I made tuna salad, and, you know, I made her some, and I made me some. And when it was done, I said, was that not the best tasting tuna salad you've ever had? <laughs> because I know that was, like, exceptionally good. And I realized foods that, to me, have just been ubiquitous. I've been eating them all my life. They are having so much more flavorfulness. And I'm enjoying them so much more because there's no more guilt. Mm, and yeah. I'm truly eating what I want to eat, what makes me happy to eat. My body is like, yeah, go for it. And I'm no longer eating because I have to eat certain things because there are certain requirements. Mm, yeah. I'm done with that. I'm free. That's good. I am That's great. I'm so done with that. That's really good. <sighs> I have to say, I, I can't completely identify with it because I, I never had the kind of guilt thing you had where food was concerned. But I did have to put up with the fact that my mom was not the world's best cook. And she'd be the first person to tell you that, by the way. Um, but literally, we grew up with flavorless food. <laughs> I'm not kidding when Aww. I say that. <laughs> so when I met Louise, who's an outstanding cook, and really loves intense flavor in her food and i started eating her food it was like whoa this is nirvana <laughs> so that part i can identify with about oh wasn't that the best food ever <laughs> See, course, no, it would not surprise me walt if your flavorless upbringing of food <laughs> didn't shoot off rockets of desire saying i would love to have food that had great flavor that was savory and was yummy and that was part of the components of what was attractive about Louise to you. Even if you wouldn't have known that on the surface, I oh, know yeah. energetically I your inner true. being would know how to do that. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. I, I'm sure that was big because certainly it worked for me that the old uh, cliche, uh, uh, the route to a man's heart is through his stomach, worked. I mean, Louise, mm. Louise got <laughs> she got through to me really fast just by cooking me dinner or cooking me, you know, something. I'm, <laughs> Our, our fourth date was short, strawberry shortcake, instant winner, right there. <laughs> That's my favorite dessert. Is I it? swear okay. to you, that is my favorite dessert. Wow. So All yeah, right. I'm heading. I'm heading to Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to make the trip to Connecticut, you know, come by, you know, toward the end of April because we're going to the Abraham wor workshop, so we can do all of it together, yeah. you know. And, and by the way, there's a diner. There's a diner down, not down the street, but like one town over that we're, we're going to go to, where they have absolutely the best heroes in the entire country. I tell you, it's delicious. The best heroes you ever you ever had. I mean, the lamb is just is melting your mouth. That's how good it is. So you know, there's another incentive for you to come. There you go. I love it. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I kind of invited myself, but now you invited. There you me. go. So yeah. It's okay. So it's <laughs> official now. So if you actually do decide to come, then then you know, there's no guilt. And we don't want any cool. guilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, okay, continuing. In, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm in the mood to do the next chapter. Well, let's go on to it then. The next one All in right. the book is a subsection that's entitled, Appreciation of It Attracts It to Me, which is certainly true, particularly where flavor of food is concerned. So, mm -hmm. thoughts that evoke your emotions are those that most quickly affect change in your life. Thoughts that you think while feeling no emotion will maintain what is already there. And so those things that you have already created and appreciate can be kept in your life by continuing to appreciate them. But those things that you do not yet have that you want very soon and very much, you must give clear, conscious, deliberate, emotion-evoking thought. Extremely... Emotion-evoking thought. Emotion-evoking. Yeah. Emotion-evoking thought. That is really true. That That is... That's the magic wand. I was having a conversation yes. with somebody on Facebook, and she was complaining, you know, there's no magic Harry Potter wand where the law of attraction is concerned. And I was saying, <laughs> well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, it's true. You can't just take a Harry Potter wand and wish something to happen. It'll happen. But on the other hand, <laughs> there are well, ways know, that the metaphor applies, you know? I had written up um, 
I don't want to say it was my wish list, but I had I had kind of like a long list of things that I desired to create in my life. And I remember making it a, a habit for a short time where I'd get up every morning and I'd read it. It was about one page long. You know, I had it typed single space and I'd read it. And, it, and then the next day I'd read it. And then the next day I'd read it. And I kept, after about five days, I'm like, I am so not feeling the needle move. Like there's nothing about this that's like causing me to sense that I should keep doing this. Well, little I didn't know this little known fact back then that you need to have an emotion evoking thought. Mm. I was just reading it. They were just words on a page because when I originally learned about intention setting, goal setting, reading affirmations, speaking affirmations, nobody explained to me that really positive emotion needed to actually undergird mm -hmm. those words. Yeah. I just read the words and I guess I just took it to mean just r the repetitiveness of saying them over and over was somehow the magic that was going to cause something to happen. Right. Well, I can tell you wrong. Doesn't, that doesn't work. work. Nope. <laughs> doesn't work at all. In fact, the, Got to have motion. when I read that phrase, emotion evoking thought instantly, you know what my mind translates that to? It mm -hmm. translates it to emotion soaked thought. Mm. You have to soak it in emotion. You can't just like do like this little tepid, you know, I just turn on the emotion for five seconds and I'm done. No, 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 no. You got to soak it in emotion. It's got to be like bursting with emotion. It's got to be laden with emotion. It's got to be filled with emotion. You know, a little, just See, turning was, on for five seconds doesn't work. <laughs> and I was just thinking of like a, a sponge. Yeah. And how if you have a dry sponge... It doesn't actually absorb anything, mm, hardly. At all. True. It does very little. You have to like saturate it, and when it's been saturated, where it's like gonna, there's so much liquid in it that now it's gonna fall out. That's the kind of emotion we're talking about. That's right. Yeah. That's the kind of emotion because otherwise, a dry sponge is just like reading great affirmations off a page. It gets no bells and whistles. The law of attraction has no clue what you're really wanting because it doesn't know words. It, it also, only knows emotion. It also occurs to me, this is the normal state of things. This, this emotion light version of thinking is the normal state of things when somebody first gets exposed to law of attraction. Because we all have that, that first initial curiosity, right? You know, it's like a little smile on our face like, oh, that, that's interesting. You know, so I have to just think the thought, okay, I think the thought. And you have to do with emotion, oh, I'd really like to have that. And there, I've done it, right? <laughs> but isn't that the way we all approach it? It's like, oh, I'll just give it this little tiny try and we'll see what happens. Not realizing that the little tiny try doesn't do it. You got to really go into it. You, you got to just, you got to basically dive in until it's over your head and you're absorbing it through every pore. Well, back in 2002, that was the first time I had ever been exposed to Abraham Hicks. Mm -hmm. And that was when my girlfriend... Um, had gotten a cassette tape that was a copy that she'd gotten from one of her clients. And she listened to it, and she went, oh, my God, Wendy, this is fabulous. You have to listen to it, too. Mm -hmm. So I did, and it was really all about, I mean, here's what's funny. Abraham has not changed their message in all these years. Yeah. <laughs> they just, you know, <laughs> they emphasize different things from time to time. But I remember, oh, my gosh, this is hysterical. The very chapter we're reading is on the creative workshop. That's right. And I'm about to tell you what I heard on this cassette tape. Oh, okay. It was all about this. It was all about a creative workshop. Okay. I literally did not remember that till right now. So I remember what I took from this was if you go into a creative workshop where you like really think about and visualize what you really want in life, it can happen. And that was like literally all I took from it. That's what I heard. Mm, and okay. I remember telling that to people. And feeling like I was faking it, even trying to like pull up the emotion, yep. because that just didn't feel like me. Mm -hmm. And so my girlfriend and I, it was Elizabeth, she and I would like go back and forth and, and she goes, isn't this exciting, Wendy? All we have to do is like dream up what we really want and we can have it. And it really felt like she was talking about a lottery ticket. <laughs> like, all you have to do is go to the 7-Eleven, buy a lottery ticket, and then you'll win. That's like, right. That's all there was to it. And we took it and ran. I mean, there was a part of it that so resonated even within me, but I didn't really understand the nuances of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about, do you remember when 
like, you know, this is probably what law of attraction newbies take in. That is exactly what I did. And then when that totally, so totally didn't do a thing for me. <laughs> right. After a couple months, I kind of just dropped it. Yep. And went, well, there's another fad gone by. That's right. <laughs> um, and then it, it was in 2007 that I was really doing some soul searching for some, you know, real meaty things to happen in my life. And I was just kind of asking my inner being, like, where do I go? Where do I find something? And the memory of those cassette tapes came back to mind. And I somehow pulled the name Abraham out of my head and I started Googling and I found their website. And from there I started buying their CDs. And mm -hmm. that's literally how my real journey with Abraham began. So it was on this creative workshop, which made no sense to me at the time. I couldn't make it work because I hadn't read the book. I just heard 30 minutes of a cassette tape. And right. That just wasn't sufficient for me. <laughs> I, and I understand that approach because that's pretty much how I approached learning about LOA for like the first when was it? First five years or so? No, I, I you know pick out YouTube videos that had little bits and pieces and try to learn from that. Or you know, I, 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 there was a website I can't even remember what it's called, Positive Intentions, something like that, um, where people would talk about it. And the, the the discussions were so shallow that I'd lose interest after five minutes. And I'm trying to think, how do I learn this stuff? I don't understand. Where am I supposed to get this from? And then finally one day. Um, now, this is after I'd been aware of The Secret for a while, and I'd played The Secret a few times, but it wasn't really getting giving me the answers I was looking for. And then finally one day I stumbled upon something about Abraham somewhere and ended up buying Asking It Is Given and started reading that, and all of a sudden stuff started to make sense for the first mm. time. Yeah. Well, you know the phrase, the, um, this, when the student is ready, the teacher appears? Yeah. Well, I believe that applies in, in, on so many levels to so many things because, you know, when I was really ready, when I was ready for a big change in my life, that's when Abraham showed up mm -hmm. or that's when I found Abraham. I don't know. You know, we attracted one another. It was a co-creation, but I really wasn't ready for it in 2002. I had a taste of it, and I think that was my inner being's way of just kind of throwing that out there so that later on I would have a reference point when I really was ready, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really ready in 2002, you know? And so sometimes even when you ask me questions like, well, how did you do this? How did you do that? You know, honestly, sometimes I wanted to say I stumbled through life. I was living by default. I didn't know how it happened, but I can kind of go back and see, well, here are the certain circumstances, but you know, I don't know that we'll ever really be able to, unravel the the breadcrumbs of how we got from point A to point B because there's so much what I like to call magic going on behind the scenes on the invisible plane oh yeah that we only see a minuscule amount of the data I, I agree with that I agree with <laughs> and that. we think we know something uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> yeah the, I, I, I agree with that and I look at that from the same point of view that a scientist looks at his uh, field of study and and if he's an honest scientist he'll say the more I learn, the more I realize that I have yet to learn. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we got. Abraham goes on to say. Yep. Go I ahead. Think there's two more paragraphs. Um, you want to finish? No. Up? Go ahead. Go ahead. You want to read it? An extremely effective use of the creative workshop is to ponder the aspects you appreciate regarding the subjects that are most important to you. Each time you revisit a subject, your attention to detail will grow stronger. And with, and with more time and more detail, your emotion about the subject will increase also. Using the creative workshop in this way accomplishes everything that is required for deliberate creation. For you are thinking about something that you want, and in your emotion of appreciation, you are allowing that which you desire to manifest in your experience. As often as you go to your creative workshop, you will begin to notice an obvious correlation between the things that you are contemplating inside your workshop and the manifestations that are showing up in your life experience. So there's a very simple description of how the creative workshop works. And actually, it's probably even better than the one that they gave earlier in the book that lasted about three pages. That was it really simply right there in a nutshell. Would you summarize it in your own words? Yeah, when I go into a creative workshop, I get myself into a calm place. I get my breathing going, and then I start piecing together all these bits of data that I've collected over you know, the last few 
hours, days, weeks, whatever, into what it is that I really want to have happen. And while I'm doing that, I'm getting excited about it and I'm focusing on it. I'm getting more and more excited and, and trying to live the, the, this thing that I'm putting together in my mind and just keep doing that until I've, I feel like I've, I've lived it inside and out and then I'm done. Got it. And By the you know, way, you you, met, you you were talking also. I got I, I wanted to throw this in because you were talking also about like it's as if uh, there, these 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 characters or whatever came into the room, and Louise and I uh, borrowed from the library a DVD of a movie that came out last year, The Man Who Invented Christmas, about Charles Dickens, which is exactly what he does in in the movie. In the movie, um, uh, the the guy who plays Dickens talks about how. When he comes up with the right name for a character, the character will appear. And literally in the movie, as he comes up with these characters, they show up in his room. And you got these people all around the room who are basically helping him work out how the story works. And they're all playing in, in their particular roles. So Scrooge is there and Marley is there and, and uh, Cratchit is there and so on and so forth. And, and they're, they're all kibitzing with him and teasing him when he can't come up with an ending. Uh, you're never going to come up with an ending for this one, Charlie, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there it is. I mean, there, there's like a, a metaphorical uh, presentation of what it's like when your ideas come to life right there in the room. Crazy. I like that. So tell me the name of that uh, movie again. I think it's The Man Who Invented Christmas. came out last year. Yeah. And it stars the guy who played um, in Downton Abbey. He played... Mary's first husband, the one who got killed in the automobile accident. I, I can't think what his name is. Dan Stevens, I believe, is the actor. Um, but he plays Dickens. Not a bad movie. I mean, it, there, there, uh, there were some ways I wasn't real happy about it, but it, it does some things well, so it's certainly worth seeing. Well, because there, there was another movie that um, Abraham has talked about that Esther and Jerry had watched. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I don't remember the name because it wasn't a movie I saw, but it had to do with like an author who would type and then he would kind of like, I don't know if the storyline just started showing up on the screen, like on the movie screen. And then he'd like throw that piece of paper away. Like, nah, I don't like that story. And he'd start all over again. And every time he would type out another part of the story, it's like you as the movie watcher would get to see how it was playing out. Mm -hmm. And then no, nope, I don't like that one. And he'd write something different. And Abraham used that as a, an example of what we do when we do our own personal creative right. manifesting, it, our own creation process. We can think about something, exactly. kind of play it through in our minds and go, no, I want to change that. And I think that's fascinating. And I think what you're talking about where the characters come to life, I think that's a really cool um, example. Oh, yeah. You know, and, it, and to me, it would be worth... It, you know, watching something like that, just so you have, because that becomes a tool. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, it's a template for how you can create. And I love those kinds of things. So um, the man that created Christmas or man, invented Christmas. Invented, I think it is. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. And, and, and it does a lot of that, too. I mean, at one point, he's walking down an alleyway. And the, the, this older man, older woman, they're both kind of overweight. Um, he reaches to her and says, come dance with me, Mrs. Fezziwig. And he stops and says, Fezziwig, that's a good name. And he writes it down. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very cool. He, he's in a restaurant wow. with his friend. And, and uh, the waiter comes over and is th like this tottering old man who's the waiter practically falls over and uh, says, uh, uh, good evening, gentlemen. My name is Marley. I'll be serving you tonight. Marley, ooh, I like that. Write that one down. <laughs> His friend says, "Oh, don't worry. He's he's writing down names all the time. It's not a big deal." <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, I hope for everybody that as you take this weekend, um, you know, that's coming up, and just play with whatever thoughts want to dance around in your imagination, because you can create anything you want. This is true. It's your choice. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, so take the time to do it. And by the way, for somebody who wants that personal attention, Wendy, how do they reach you? They can reach me by going to wendydillard.com. Sounds great. Wendy, it's been a pleasure, and I can't wait to talk to you on Monday, but have a good weekend in the meantime. I sure will. I hope everybody else does, too. I do as well, and we hope that you'll join us next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.